So we've had some pretty heavy stuff this week, and here we're going to have some fun with some elementary truths of quantum mechanics. Um, I sort of heard that decoherence is becoming one of your buzzwords, so I thought when, uh, I was very pleased when Laura invited me to talk and to review some of the stuff we've been doing over many years in this field, and maybe some of the insights or things that we have seen will be helpful. And only at the very end will I have something relevant to space-time or relativity. Um, so uh, I call it uh, quantum damping because this is the name that uh, we originally gave to it with my friend uh, Robert Harris. I don't know if anybody knows him. He's a physical chemist at Berkeley, Bobby Harris. And uh, you'll see in a second why it was good that he was a physical chemist. So um, the best way to start, I think, is the historical uh, ordering of uh, how this developed. And um, the first thing was that in this work with Bobby, um, we found something which is too good to be true. And like most things, when something is too good to be true, it is too good to be true. And this was, and this was a, a way of measuring incredibly small energies. And uh, the point was that back in the 1970s, uh, we were looking for neutral currents. Now, um, this was one of the uh, unusual or strong signs of the weak interaction standard model that you would have in contrast to some other models, a direct interaction with parity violation between an electron and a nucleon or a nucleus. Sort of like, the, now we say Z0, Z0 exchange. It would be like the Coulomb force, more or less, but short range, and would have parity violation. So Bobby and I were thinking, well, how can we uh, detect this small uh, parity violation? And one thought that occurs to you is, if you're talking about parity, of course, you have in, in, in physical chemistry left and right isomers, different chiral states of the same thing. And so um, our, our guesstimate of the energy difference with this sought-for neutral current would, would, would be extremely small, because it's weak interactions, short range. And we got uh, 10 to the mice, 10 to the minus 15th electron volts or less. Now, uh, or in time units, this is the inverse of one second or longer. So um, you could hope to, let's say, take uh, some molecular levels in, in a left or a right isomer of the same stuff and see if these energies were slightly different by spectroscopy. But this is hopeless. You will never see something so small. And uh, Bobby and I were thinking about, well, how can we possibly uh, see this? And now, uh, being an old admirer of the famous K0 oscillations, we got the idea, well, you can have an, an analogy with parity uh, as the quantum number, as you have with K0 oscillations, which you have with strangeness. That is, you have two degenerate states, left and right states of a, of a chiral isomer, and there should be some oscillations between them. Uh, so, for example, the uh, Hamiltonian of such a system would look like this in the basis of left and right states. There's a tunneling energy, which is conventional, although difficult to calculate in practical cases, and the parity violation would be this epsilon, which would mean that the left and the right isomer would have slightly different energies. And this, as I say, this epsilon is 10 to the minus 15th electron volts or less. Well, um, but how are you going to see this tiny epsilon? Well, it's easy. Uh, oh, yeah, so, so here's the simplest example you can think up of... of of the chiral molecule. You, you can have, for example, an ammonia-like structure 
Uh, hey, my laser stopped working. Where is it? Oh, yeah, there it is. So you can have an ammonia-like structure uh, where the nitrogen is above or below the plane of the hydrogen atoms. A slight technical point is you have to make the hydrogen atoms different for it to really have a hand in this because you have to be able to go around one way or go around the other way. But this is practically the simplest thing you can think of for a, a chiral molecule. Uh, and uh, the trouble is that the nitrogen um, oscillations, which this is the ammonia maser, which you may have heard of. If you change the nitrogen to phosphorus or some heavier group, you can slow down the oscillations because it's a tunneling process. So you put in something heavier. And you can get this to be on the order of, of the one second or so that we need. So it's conceivable you could do this with uh, substituting something for the nitrogen. So it's, it's a tunneling problem between the left and the right isomer. And uh, if both potential whales are exactly the same depth, then there's no parity violation. But if they're slightly different, we could hope to see them. And the point is, um, since the tunneling energy is also so small, let's say one second inverse, um, you, can you can compare your small parity violation energy with the small tunneling energy, and maybe the ratio gives something interesting. And in fact, here it is. Um, let's say you started with a left isomer, and you let it oscillate. If parity is conserved, there will be symmetric oscillations, because the left and the right isomer are exactly the same. But if parity is not conserved, you will have these asymmetric oscillations. This axis is the amount of left or right. So it's easy. You start off with a beam of left uh, 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 isomers. You let them fly along. One second later, there's the detector here. And you see uh, how often it oscillates into the right isomer. Nothing to it. Except <laughs> this is obviously too good to be true. Something must be wrong uh, as a practical matter. Why doesn't this work? Well. After some thought, we realized there's an elementary reason why it doesn't work, which is that um, even, in the be even in the best vacuum, uh, this molecule will hit something within one second. Uh, I, 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 uh, even some residual gas of the best vacuum will lead to some collisions. I don't know about, haven't looked at it for nowadays, with the vacuums you get nowadays, but I think even with the best vacuums you can make now, uh, this thing will hit something within one second. Uh, so we were faced with a problem if we want to really um, pursue this as a practical matter. How do you treat these collisions? And so you need some kind of quasi-scientific theory of the decoherence induced by hitting something. So um, when, the th when, the, when the wave function is oscillating along, what do you do when it hits something? Uh, do you stop the clock and start the wave function again? How do you know what state it was in? It's quite confusing once you think about this. Uh, and, uh, and of course, th there's a real practical question. We're proposing an actual experiment. We want to know what's going to be seen at this end if you cannot avoid the collisions. Well. There's a tool in quantum mechanics for dealing with such problems, and that's the density matrix. And so what you need to do is to apply your ideas and intuition to the density matrix. So um, we have the simplest system you can think of for the density matrix, a two-by-two, two, uh, a two-state system or a two-by-two two density matrix, which you can characterize, which you can write like this. And you can write the density matrix in this simple case as a polarization vector times the Pauli matrices. And as time goes on, this, um, this polarization vector will rotate around. Being a two-state system, it's uh, isomorphic to a spin, and it's easy to visualize when you look at what this polarization uh, vector is doing. So um, here's a picture. You see, the, uh, there's a, 
there's the internal Hamiltonian, which I just showed you, which you can view as a sort of magnetic field, this V, which in the case I wrote down would be the Z component would be the parity violation uh, energy, and the X component would be the tunneling energy. And at this elementary level where there's no external world, this polarization vector is rotating around the uh, V, the pseudo-magnetic field. And um, I'm sure this, you've all shown this when you've taught first class in quantum mechanics. And if you apply the equations of motion for the density matrix, uh, you will find that, indeed, P dot, uh, P is rotating around the pseudo-magnetic field. Now, you, one important thing about this is, is that uh, P, uh, P does not change its length, right? If you take the scalar product of P times P dot, um, it's zero because of the cross product. So uh, this vector, the, the, the polarization vector of the density matrix is rotating around, but not changing its length. Even as we'll see in some applications later, if the pseudo-magnetic field, if the V is moving, which arises in some problems, uh, the, the P still stays of length one. So um, we haven't yet got any decoherence. The, we've still got a pure state. The, uh, this, um, this density matrix obeys rho squared equals rho. It's a pure state as long as the absolute size of P is one. So now let's figure out how we're going to get uh, P to change its length. Well, we have to introduce some external world. So let's, let's imagine us uh, embedded, embedding our, uh, our chiral molecule or other system into some external world. And, uh, and let's write the big wave function of the sp spin, so let's call these two states plus and minus, of the spin variable into some big wave function characterized by some environment which, uh, with, with, a lot, with a lot of coordinates. Now, if you, if you trace out the other coordinates, here's what the density matrix for the spin for the two-state system looks like. You have diagonal elements which essentially tell you how much you've got of one state, let's say the left isomer, how much you've got of the other isomer, and an overlap between uh, the wave functions connected with those two states from in the rest of the world. See, the, taking the trace gives you the, the scalar product of this rest of the world wave function. Right? So, um, so what we're looking for as uh, with the progress of time, how this overlap of the rest of the world wave function uh, decreases with time as it becomes more correlated uh, with the state of the spin. Let's imagine that um, immediately at time equals zero when I threw the chiral molecule into the medium, uh, the state of the rest of the world did not depend on the state of the spin. In other words, phi plus was equal to phi minus. So then obviously, any things I do on the spin, any measurements or manipulations I do on the spin, will be coherent because the rest of the world doesn't care. The, the phi plus scalar product with itself will always be one. But um, in, the, in the other extreme limit, where the phi plus and the phi minus, the rest of the world weight function, are orthogonal, then uh, I can't get any interference when I measure something between the two states of the spin because the, uh, the rest of the world will be orthogonal. There can't be any interference effects between these two, two states of the spin. So that's what I, what I wrote here. That's the interpretation of, the, of this two by two density matrix. So to uh, understand the development of the decoherence or how this polarization vector 
Ah, uh, Laura, you're here, great. <laughs> to understand how this polarization vector is decreasing, we need some model of, of, um, of how the rest of the world is, is interacting with the spin, or with, with the chiral molecule. So, uh, here's what you do. Uh, let's, let's imagine that uh, I divide the rest of the world, some other molecules or atoms or photons, into those which have not yet interacted with the spin and those that have. So here comes a molecule from the environment flying along and it hits the molecule. And now we, ha we have to use the S matrix in the original Heisenberg sense. What is the S matrix? It turns an initial wave function into a uh, final wave function. So if the, um, and it's important that I'm using S and not T, you know, not the transition matrix, but the whole S matrix, including the one in the S matrix, that's the most important part of the S matrix. Uh, so it'll, it'll produce a different state of the environment according to whether it's interacting with the left or right isomer or with the plus or minus state. So what is changing is that overlap uh, in the, in the, off, oops, the overlap in the uh, off diagonal elements of the density matrix. So if, if you follow this thought of the off diagonal elements of the density matrix, you see what, what's happening is that this is decreasing because S scattering on one isomer may be different than scattering on the other isomer. And if you work out what you get, you'll see there'll be some decreasing with a minus sign of the off diagonal element, some decoherence being created per unit time if I have regular uh, collisions with the, with the isomer or the abstract spin. So if, if you work this out with the, with the details, you get the, you get the following formula for, so we've, we've now got a decoherence rate, how fast the off diagonal elements are decreasing. And if you work out what I just said with some details, uh, you get the final formula that the decoherence rate is this. It's the flux of incoming uh, particles from the environment. Imaginary I times something. This funny business with the imaginary I, uh, I use this notation because it then makes the scattering amplitudes look like those you have in the textbook for ordinary scattering theory. Times the following. Uh, one minus S dagger for the uh, scattering on one isomer or one, or one state times the scattering on the other state. This just follows from the thought if you look at what's happening to the decrease of this overlap. Now, um, this is a very amusing formula with all kinds of nice uh, properties. Y y one way of looking at it is that it's um, sort of the unitarity deficit in the interaction with the environment. See, this would, if, if the two states scattered exactly the same, so if you were in this interesting limit here, you would not get any decoherence. D would be zero, because then it would be purely unitary. You wouldn't have any unitarity deficit. This would be just one minus one equals zero in this, in this formula. So this is one of our first interesting observations for your delectation, um, that not all collisions stop the clock. You can have many collisions with your system, but unless the system, uh, unless it uh, reacts differently in the two states, there's no decoherence. So uh, the vague feeling that every collision somehow restarts the clock is not actually true. It, it, it depends on the nature of the collision. And of course, maybe a zeroth order point is to say that this is real physics, there has to be some interaction. You can't decohere something by just thinking about it. I mean, something is really happening. There has to be a real 
non-trivial S matrix. And furthermore, the S matrix has to have the property, if you want decoherence, that the two scatterings are different. The two scattering amplitudes are different. And, um, and, for, and this has a real practical meaning. For example, one of the uh, examples that Bobby and I worked out um, was that imagine I have my chiral molecules in a buffer gas of, of liquid helium at low temperature. We were trying to think of some way of containing it so you could do some of these experiments. Now, it turns out helium is a nice round atom. And at low temperature, everything's, helium atoms are moving very slowly. So most of the scatterings on the chiral molecule will actually be in the S wave. And so since S wave is spherically symmetric and the helium is nice and round, uh, actually most scatterings will not be able to feel whether they're on the left or the right isomer. So we estimated that actually the only, I think it was one in 10,000 or one in a million scatterings would actually decohere the isomer. Uh, and I think this is one of the observations you should keep in mind in some of the folklore on these things, that uh, not all scatterings, actually, not all interactions decohere. Uh, let's look at the opposite limit, where it is more, which is more like the usual idea. Um, let's say that one scattering, let's say on the, on the left isomer, there's no scattering, and just, one, and just the other one are scattering. Um, then if you work out this formula, in, um, in that case, you see I have 1 minus S of the, of the, uh, of, of the plus scattering, amp, uh, plus S matrix. And you remember 1 minus S is the T matrix, is the true usual scattering amplitude with an I and so on. And because of the way I define the I's here, you get by the optical theorem that indeed, in that case, the D is the scattering rate of the one which is interacting. There's a one half here, which is sort of a quantum effect. Um, and uh, so therefore, in this case, you get the uh, naive uh, idea that every, sc every scattering, in a sense, leads to some decoherence. And um, b by the use of the optical theorem on the, w on the, on the, on the scattering matrix, where the imaginary part is the, the, the cross section. That's why I define the eyes that way. And, um, and, uh, and here you have the normal intuition in this limit um, that every scattering is decohering the system. Uh, and then, of course, you can imagine many intermediate situations between these two cases, and you have to get the phases and everything right. I've worked out some examples in, uh, in some solid-state devices for this. Now, um, so what, what, what lessons do we have here? Well, um, first of all, uh, the decoherence rate is the dissipative quantity. It's like it comes from the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude, and you need some, some dissipation going on. And this stuff is continually being rediscovered and sometimes messed up, and so on. And one of the things you should watch out is... Um, that if somebody is trying to sell you a, uh, de a decoherence process where there's no imaginary part of something, be suspicious. Uh, there's probably something wrong. And uh, the, uh, the point is, uh, the real part actually also has a meaning. The, uh, the real part of, the, of this quantity here, where I just took the imaginary part, the real part it means the level shift of the, of the isomers due to the interaction with the medium. Uh, if you look back at that density matrix formula, um, it leads to a phase factor for the two components of the density matrix, which means it's rotating, so it, it leads to, a, to an energy shift, but not a dissipation. Uh, and uh, one of the ways I got convinced at the time when we were doing this that we had the right formula is that if you do this with the real part, uh, you indeed, uh, you know, there's this classical formula from optics, uh, which is also you say in neutron physics, 
for the index of refraction of a particle in a medium. And if you use our formula for the real part, you get the right formula for the index of refraction. But, okay, here, here we're, we're mainly interested in the imaginary part, the, uh, the dissipation. So, doing this, uh, you, you get the final formula for the evolution of this um, density matrix in terms of this polarization vector, which is like this the rotation due to the internal Hamiltonian, and then the dissipation uh, due to the interaction with the medium. And it's all incorporated in this parameter D for the dissipation. So, uh, this will lead to a shrinking of P, and you will have decoherence. And this will continually shrink with time. And with this uh, formula, you can calculate how the chirality of the molecule is uh, how the d density matrix is approaching the mixed state for uh, molecules, how neutrinos oscillate in a medium, uh, how states of a qubit are being washed out by decoherence and so on. And I'll try to roughly talk about some of these things if I have time. So here, here's what a typical solution looks like for the rotation of that vector which is precessing around the polarization vector. If I start it uh, at time equals zero, it wants to oscillate, uh, but then the decoherence starts affecting it and it damps out. Uh, this is a particularly useful case to show where the um, internal Hamiltonian and the D are about the same order of magnitude. And we've worked out many different examples. Uh, so, as you would expect, of course, this D is leading to a loss of coherence, or as you people like to say, information. <laughs> and um, here's, for example, you can calculate the change of the entropy defined by rho log rho, and you find indeed that uh, it's uh, decreasing, uh, increasing rather, <laughs> and um, and uh, one nice thing to note, as you would expect, uh, the arrow of time came out right. That is that, that the D uh, is leading to a positive quantity. This quantity on the right is intrinsically positive. Um, the reason for that is my basic formula is the mismatch between two unitary operators, the, the unitarity deficit. This mismatch can never lead to anything must lead to something less than one. So that's why the D is, we've defined it comes out such that you have D of a certain sign, which is positive, because the mismatch of unitary operator cannot, must be something less than one. <coughs> um, so uh, now there were some amusing paradoxes connected with all this. Uh, and some of them at first I were quite baffling and uh, the, the oldest and earliest one, which we understood in the beginning, which is still nice, uh, you remember Hund, Hund's rule from atomic physics, some, something from the early days of molecules, I think, early days of quantum mechanics. So Hund, in the 1920s, um, asked himself, hey, how come when we look at molecules, we see the chiral states? You know, when Pasteur was scraping wine barrels and analyzing their optical activity. Uh, he, he found one kind of handedness for the organic molecules. Um, and, and Hund, being one of the early quantum mechanicians, said this is wrong because we know when you have some tunneling between the two states, uh, the true ground state is, is left, or pl uh, left plus or minus right. It's not the chiral state. So, um, Hund answered himself by saying, oh, that's easy. Um, if, you, if you calculate the tunneling time uh, of a sugar molecule, it's longer than the age of any conceivable age of the universe. So, it's just tunneling, but it takes an infinite, essentially infinite time from our point of view. But, as you saw from my third page there with the little uh, ammonia-like molecules, that's not always true. You can, you can cook up some molecules where the tunneling time is, is seconds. So, um, 
Kuhn's answer, well, right for biological molecules is not really the full answer. Well, in modern times, there's another answer, um, which is that um, the parity violation. You see, if I make um, the Z component of my internal Hamiltonian big enough compared to the tunneling time, the polarization vector will be stuck in the polar direction and it'll just do some tiny oscillations, but it will still stay. I will favor one-handedness and it'll still stay there. So um, this is a possible explanation, but again, you can cook up examples where this may not be true. But the real, an the real answer, which always applies more or less, which Bobby and I understood, um, was that the real answer is decoherence. That is, um, the interactions with the environment will break uh, the phases or whatever you need for the tunneling, and the state will be effectively frozen into one of the isomers. This is mathematically expressed by the following fact. If you take the large D limit, so when the, so when in that, in that formula that I showed you, when the, um, here, when the D is much bigger than the V, uh, you get to uh, an over, instead of damping, damped oscillations like this, you get to over damping, like you're familiar with from mechanics. And um, over damping leads to the following behavior for the polarization vector. It gets frozen in the z direction, and uh, the decoherence parameter essentially stops the tunneling. And, and you get a frozen vector, which is frozen into one state. So the environment actually keeps one of the chiral isomers where it is. If you evaluate this thing for typical molecules, uh, you get, again, extremely long time so that in reality it's frozen into one of the states. Um, and I think this is the real answer to Hund's paradox, although the other answers apply in certain cases also. So the collisions somehow interrupt the tunneling. And I'll, expl I'll explain in a minute one nice way of understanding this. Um, now, a, so, let's see if, yeah, uh, we'll just, okay, one more minute. So now the second paradox, now it's getting worse. Now we come to Turing's paradox. Um, this is something for historians of science. There was a story going around <laughs> in my youth that one time at, at tea time at the Institute in Princeton, Turing said the following, um, if according to Copenhagen, uh, when you measure something, you put it into, the, into one state of the measurement. So if you measure its position after the measurement, it's in one definite position, even though before the measurement maybe it, it was in some coherent state of different positions. Um, the, so then Turing said, okay, well, if, if measuring it puts it in, in a certain position, why don't we measure it again? We'll put it back in the same position. If you keep measuring it rapidly, it'll never move. And there was a lot of confusion and unclear what this was and so on. Various, this whole field is full of various mystical and philosophical ideas. But actually, Turing was right. And in fact, uh, this Turing behavior is a consequence of our equation. Because if I make the D, which you can view as measuring the molecule or the spin system repeatedly, that means I've got a big D, and in big D, I've got this limit, where indeed the quality, what I'm measuring, let's say the chirality, is not evolving or is frozen into uh, uh, its initial position and can't move or moves very slowly. So uh, uh, this is uh, nothing mystical, it's just a s solution of that P dot equation in the, in, in the limit of, um, of strong damping. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, it's just that the environment, uh, 
uh, the, uh, stops the tunneling and it stays in the state it was. Um, by the way, this is sometimes called the watch pot effect. I have to explain to the English, non-English native speakers that in English there's a saying, if you're cooking, making tea or something, and you keep looking to see if the water's boiling, it seems to never boil. The more you look at it, the longer it takes. And that's uh, essentially what our equation is saying here. And as I say, in many practical examples, you will find that this parameter uh, is, uh, is extremely big, so that in effect, the, the system is entirely frozen. And, uh, and I, there's another paradoxical way of seeing this, by the way, that you see, the D is more or less how often you're hitting the system. So you are saying that the more often you hit the system, the slower it relaxes, which is somehow uh, maybe contrary to common sense. Uh, but that's because uh, when you look back to the two barrier problem, let's see where did I have this? Uh, no, I don't, don't seem to have it. Okay. Anyway, it's the double, it's the double uh, potential well problem. And, and we are considering the, the tunneling through the barrier. Now, the normal everyday intuition that when you hit something, it'll relax faster is the classical intuition, which says that if you hit it more often, it'll jump over the barrier more often. That's true. But we are talking here about the quantum regime where the relaxation is through the tunneling. And in that case, it, it works opposite, that the more often you hit it, the less it'll tunnel. Uh, and one of our predictions in, in this old work with Bobby was that um, if you could do this experiment, you would find that, that at low t once you got the system cold enough so there was no barrier jumping, uh, you would find this inverse uh, anti-common sense behavior that the faster collisions led to less tunneling, less relaxation. So here's a simulation we did um, in some related problem where we started the uh, polarization vector at some angle to the z-axis, so it was a coherent mixture of the two qualities, let's say left and right, or two kinds of neutrinos. And um, you find that um, if, you, if you have a big D, here's what happens. Very quickly, the length of the, of the polarization changes. So the vertical axis is the length of the polarization vector, the amount of coherence. One would be perfect coherence, and uh, with a big D, the length changes a lot, and it, sh it shrinks the, the polarization vector to the Z axis, the quality axis. And then, uh, and then once it's there, nothing more happens for a long time. That's the Turing paradox or the watch pot. It's, it's hardly de uh, decreasing at all because we've inhibited the tunneling by the repeated collisions. Mathematically, it's just the big D from that precession equation. So, now we come to the problem that everybody's scratching their head about. How, the, how much time have I got? Minus one. What? Minus one. Oh, I still didn't get to uh, many of the... Oh, 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 we started oh. 10 minutes late. Okay, can, can we keep it to five more minutes? Because Give, give me five more. or 10 minutes. Uh, okay, we will have a very short discussion then. 10 minutes um, discussion. So why do the, uh, why do the uh, outside influences stop the tunneling? Uh, and uh, after many discussions with many people, um, there was a nice, uh, well, somehow the phases, the you, you know, tunneling, uh, is a delicate quantum mechanical process and somehow the phases are getting messed up. One of the nicest uh, explanations or suggestions was given to me by uh, Michael Berry. Now, you see, the, so for, for, uh, for tunneling in a two-state system, you have two levels which are almost perfectly degenerate. And now, if you're wiggling these potential wells, uh, the degeneracy is continually being lifted. So you never have perfect degeneracy. And this will inhibit, inhibit the, uh, the tunneling. This, uh, this seems 
to be, uh, to me, one of the nicest explanations of what's really going on. That the, that the constant wiggling of the potentials lifts the de tunneling degeneracy. And now, um, that's nice because there's an even worse paradox. After Hund's paradox and after Turing's paradox, here's the one which is obviously crazy, but for, it took me for a long time to understand the answer. And this, I think, is due to this explanation about the wiggling of the potential wells. Um, let's have a particle or an atom uh, which is about to decay. So I've, I have a bunch of detectors around, and um, these detectors are always observing that the atom has not decayed yet, the atomic level. So it's like the Turing paradox, which I claimed is correct. Uh, if I'm always looking at it, do I stop the atom from decaying? Well, this is obviously insane, but why? <laughs> and um, I think the explanation is the following. I drew a picture because I forgot to put it on a tr transparency. Um, uh, you see what's happening? Let, um, let, uh, let's consider uh, the model of a, of a resonance or of a decay where you have one particle trapped in a potential well, a uh, one level trapped in a potential well, and it's, it's transiting, transiting to the continuum, which as you remember, you, you have to introduce the continuum when you uh, teach the golden rule for these things. So what's happening is that even if you wiggle these potentials, you will always be degenerate with somebody. It's different than the two-state problem. So that, indeed, you get the common sense answer <laughs> that observing if a particle has decayed doesn't stop it from decaying. At least in real life as we have it around us here. Uh, uh, <clears throat> okay, so what I don't have time to talk about where, has, where there has been mo most of the real sort of practical work in this field has to do with neutrino oscillations. As you have undoubtedly have heard, neutrinos can oscillate between their different flavors. So uh, an electron neutrino can become a muon neutrino and so forth. And so it's the same kind of problem. And, um, and this actually plays an important role, let's say, in, uh, in core collapse supernovas. Because uh, the Fermi level uh, is much lower if you distribute the neutrinos over two types of neutrinos. And therefore the pressure in the star is different and you influence the progress of the supernova. So, so the question is, uh, the damping, as we have worked out uh, in generalizations of this, can perhaps stop uh, the oscillations, which would affect how the supernova really evolves. So this is a big subject with many people working on it. Here's some references. I don't have time to talk about it. Uh, but it's actually one of the most interesting aspects, uh, practical, sort of practical aspects. Here's another uh, aspect um, with... Um, uh, a professor from Krakow and his students, we developed some studies of this for quantum logic devices. For example, um, the simplest one uh, would be, we, we studied the realization with practical parameters with some squid people using the two states of a squid, you know, where the, uh, the so-called RF squid, where the electrons are going, a macroscopic number of electrons are going this way around the loop or going that way around the loop and you have a, essentially a two-state quantum system, and, um, and you can have tunneling between the two states. And this is a realization of the, of the knot, of, of, the quant uh, of the information bit. You could say this is zero and this is one. And uh, you, you can find the Hamiltonian uh, using the capacity, capacitances and inductances of the squid, which if you've got some squid experts, they, they would tell you what you are and uh, what they are, and we developed a series of programs dealing with these things, and especially the effect of decoherence. Because the important thing in the quantum computer is, of course, how long does a device like this stay in a coherent state and act like, a, like it's quantum. So we have a whole set of nice programs and some of the references. You'll see some work we did with that. It's a very pretty system. W what you see here is 
this squid Hamiltonian, on the, here, the two le, here the two potential wells are exactly the same. And here I've raised one a little bit, and you see the two levels split a little bit. Here's the splitting. And this is the qubit, the two states of the, uh, of, of, of the squid, which can be in coherent linear combinations. And we um, imposed decoherence by wiggling these wells a little bit to find something we could do in the computer. We, we, added a, uh, we added a noise term to that Hamiltonian where the wells are being wiggled. And you can then derive a D parameter and, and see how this is evolving. And you can compare our, our simplified formalism with the true simulation of the quantum mechanical problem with these wells. And we find, indeed, close agreement with our simplified formalism with the D. And even we predict what the D is in terms of the noise. So this brings me to uh, one of the next amusing things you can do with this system is to study the, uh, the, uh, the quantum classical transition. Um, so you say, say you've got this two potential well problem and, uh, and you start with your system on one side in one potential well. And these students made nice pictures in, the, in their programs, but you could ev even see the wave packets moving back and forth uh, between the wells. But anyway, let's say you've started the uh, system in one side of the potential well, and now if I uh, move to the other configuration where I invert the which well is higher and which well is lower, these levels will cross at some point and it'll tunnel to the other side. So here you see the quantum behavior. I started in this state, I raised potential wells, and it, tun it tunneled to the other side. And indeed, in the, in the pictures, the wave packet moves to the other side when you solve the Schrodinger equation with that Hamiltonian. So now, um, we, what happens now when we turn on the decoherence, as it's done by applying the noise to the potential wells? Um, you will find, indeed, that um, you will stop the tunneling and it, it'll stay on the right-hand side. That's because, as I keep saying, the environment or the noise stopped the tunneling. So you see, that's the, that's, uh, uh, that's the uh, quantum to classical transition. When you've got a lot of noise, it doesn't tunnel, it stays on this side. And when you don't have a lot of noise, it, it goes to the other side. So this is actually a way of measuring the decoherence parameter also. Because according to how fast you move these things past each other, which you can do in the practical case uh, by varying an external magnetic field, uh, you can see at what speed you have, at what point in, in speed you have stopped the tunneling. So you've seen the quantum to classical transition. Okay, Laura's gonna shut me up. Let me come to the thing which you might be interested in professionally. And this is what I like to call, um, I, wanted to, I, wanted, I wanted to say decoherence stops the clock. But actually, uh, that's not what I mean to say. I mean to say that when you have a lot of decoherence, uh, there isn't any clock. <laughs> and th this is a simple to understand um, because what is a clock? It's something which has to move, or in, in particular, usually oscillating, right? A clock goes around once a day. So uh, you need some oscillating system to have a clock. Okay, so the simplest clock you can think of is, is a system made of two, oh yeah, and, and the system, of course, has to have d different energy states. If you don't have different energy states, there's nothing to oscillate. So let's go back to my original favorite thing, the K0 system. If I have two states of K0s with different masses, when I square the wave function, I will get an oscillating term. That's the clock. So with K0s, uh, I've got a clock. Now, uh, however, for this to work, the two mass states have to be coherent. You have to be able to interfere them to get this cosine term. 
Now, is there any uh, known force or which interacts with different masses differently? I bet you all know what it is. So, um, in, a, in a high or rapidly varying gravitational field, you will get some decoherence between the two mass states and the clock will stop working. Uh, and in fact, since gravity is universal, it'll do that to any pair uh, of energy states. It's not just an accident. There's something intrinsic about this. So it seems to me that under conditions as we normally uh, view the early universe, very hot random fields, you will indeed not have clocks anymore, even in principle. And to try to understand this a little bit, I did a calculation of, of my d parameter for this k meson problem and at, at near the Planck scale. And here's what I got. As you would expect, it's inversely proportional to the Planck mass to some power and uh, is uh, increasing with the temperature. And uh, so naturally, it's only of practical relevance in this sense near the Planck scale. But um, I defy you to invent a clock which will work near the Planck scale in, in our usual understanding of what goes on near the Planck scale, unless in some way it's very cold. So you might wonder, if there's no such thing as a clock, what, what happens to the, our, all our concepts in general relativity? And of course, um, y you can uh, uh, do the same for a ruler. In the same way, of course, you can, uh, to have a ruler, remember, to localize position, you, you need a lot of momentum states to lead to a well-defined position. So uh, if these momentum states are getting incoherent, you don't have a ruler either. So um, this is a fine problem to think about tonight when you're going to sleep. How can you have general relativity without clocks or rulers? <laughs> All right. Uh, Here's a couple of more homework problems which I would like to see answered for myself also. Um, the, uh, this D, the decoherence uh, rate, is a kind of dissipative parameter like the resistance in electricity. And, okay, okay, let me just make the two homework problems here. The, um, in electricity, uh, you have something called the decoherence fluctuation relation, where a resistance leads to a fluctuation in the current. So, um, what is fluctuating when you have D? If it's a kind of resistance like quantity. And I have some thoughts about this you can find in the references, that, but I'm not ent entirely satisfied with the answer. Uh, another nice problem is that um, for our computer simulations, we um, put this noise term in the Hamiltonian. And a question you can obviously ask yourself, is that really equivalent to tracing over an environment? It seems intuitively obvious that sometimes it's right, but is this really a complete answer? And how do I show it? And if anybody has any ideas uh, uh, how to do this, I'd be grateful. And of course, finally, ho final homework problem is um, how do we go beyond the two levels? We would like to really deal with the continuum and uh, at least in this very simple stuff I've been explaining where you can do everything with your fingers and toes, uh, we haven't really de dealt with, with the continuum problem. Okay, sorry for being so long, thank you. Uh, yeah, just, just a comment that uh, the first half of your talk on chiral molecules uh, has been redone by some a, uh, some uh, computer uh, chemists uh, a few years ago, uh, and I'm sure you would be interested to read them. They you go beyond the two levels. They actually deal with a hundred or more levels. They've got a chiral molecule which they chose to be deuterium disulfide, yeah. for strange reasons. 
uh, but it's chiral. It's a very small chiral molecule. And, and do they actually calculate the scattering amplitude? They actually, using a master equation, they put, they uh -huh. calculate the evolution of, of the uh, density matrix where that molecule is, is in a bath of helium. Okay, because I say some of the things I've seen that this is they've they've got mixed up between the real part and the imaginary part. I don't know if they. I I don't know. I I, I, I only read reviews of the paper. I didn't. It was, uh, but I can give you the references. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure you will find it amusing because yeah. it did say that it they had to re invent new computer techniques and then spend a month run a computer for a month doing. 100 by 100 matrices, or maybe it was Well, I mean, this, this original experiment that we proposed with the left tunneling to the right is a beautiful experiment waiting to be done, a Nobel Prize yeah. level well, experiment if anybody can, can do it. Well, they chose mm -hmm. this particular molecule with the hope that it could be done experimentally. Mm -hmm. the, uh, their estimate of the uh, oscillation rate was, uh, I think, 170 hertz or something like that. So it was, and it was this molecule, it looks it looks like hydrogen peroxide, but they didn't want to use hydrogen peroxide because in reality that's explosive when it's pure, uh, and so they wanted to get disulfide. And then they found well, if we use deuterium instead of hydrogen, some of these numbers get closer to what an experimentalist might like. But anyway, they've done this work, which seems to be an example of exactly what you're talking about, but keyed to a more real world where they might do the experiments. Other questions or comments? Well, it, okay. It, 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 my, uh, I, I have a, a question then about the uh, the watched pot effect. I'm yeah. a little a little bit puzzled. If I if I have a system with a, let's say a, a, a time dependent wave function, but uh, where the amplitude for something say to have made a transition uh, after a, a relatively short time is very small. Uh, it's certainly true that if I measure it and then restore it back in its original state, it's not going to decay. But it isn't maybe a, a, a better way to think of it is imagine you have a very large uh, ensemble of such systems. You have a large ensemble of systems that you've prepared no, identically. I, okay. So that then, then when, you, uh, uh, when you start measuring them, it's true that most of the time you'll put them back in the original state. But, some, uh, but there'll be some fraction you'll find uh, even after a short time will be, uh, have, have decayed. Well, so this is why I insist that the right thing for doing such problems is density matrix. There you've averaged over ensembles and uh, the, the, there's nothing to worry about. There is one time-dependent density matrix and that answers all questions. But, it, but isn't the density matrix throwing away some information? No. I think you're missing something. It's by all the pure, looking by the way, the density. Uh, this reminds me of another comment that I want to make. It's not about decoherence. We had some discussions earlier uh, about where wave packets were coming up. And here's a paper you might, by me that you might be interested in where I explain that most of the time when you're talking about wave packets, you actually don't need them. And, um, and talking about ensembles and wave packets is all unnecessary. You just take the density matrix and this answers all questions. And in particular, when you have a stationary problem, uh, there can be no coherence between different energy states. The thing I don't understand about the black hole problem is, it, do we have a stationary problem really or not? That, I don't know. So this is not on this subject, but you might be interested in this paper. Yeah, so Paul? Couple the system to say von Neumann uh, uh, detector, then the interaction Hamiltonian with the detector is such that uh, it uh, it's not like having an ensemble of freely decaying particles and you just sample them. The, mm. you, the interaction actually knocks the thing back to the initial state with a very high probability. So that that's all been worked out in quite some detail. You have to take into account the, that interaction. High, high probability, not probability one. No, 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 no. Of course yeah. not. Yeah. But in the limit of continuous measurement, then it is probability one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, and b by the way, uh, didn't Wigner tell us that uh, there's a superselection rule, which means you can't have superpositions of wave functions of different masses? Mm 
Was there a question you wanted? Yes, uh, do you know? I, no, no, I, no, I would have thought you would know the answer to that, Kelly. Yeah, no. <laughs> right. Not Vigna. But, uh, but there I is think such the a super selection for. rule doesn't say that you can't have a, a, a superposition of different masses. What it says is that, is that a superposition is indistinguishable from a mixture. Right. But, okay. I just wanted to know the bottom line about uh, biology. Are, are you telling us that the uh, pre preference of one enantiomer for another, and for example, sugars, is, is really what? related? Is in biology? Are you? T what's the bottom line of your comments? Okay, in biology is, um, is it really related the to the weak interactions? We, uh, we can explain um, if you start with one chirality why you stay there, but we can't at at the level of decoherence. Maybe some of the other stuff, but uh, anyway. We can't explain why you chose one rather than the other initially. Abdus Salam towards another, the end of his life had comments on this. Abdus Salam had some comments on this towards the end of his life, but I don't think they were taken very seriously. But we had a paper on it, the yes. very last paper he sent me. Yeah, I know. Me. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. what I meant. Yeah. You don't, I mean, the point is anything that breaks the chirality. There are lots of things that can break it, uh, and then if you iterate and amplify, doesn't matter how you start it off doesn't have to be weak interactions. could be chiral surfaces, catalytic surfaces, for example, uh, or even polarized starlight. These things you know, will all give you an enantiomeric excess, which could then, in principle, be amplified. Nobody quite knows the details. Uh, though my collaborator, Sarah Walker, did her entire PhD thesis on it. OK, any other? Comments or questions? Well, maybe, maybe I'll ask well, maybe one more. Uh, you, you didn't really say anything. You said you mentioned gravity b uh, briefly at the end, but you didn't say anything about black holes, which is of no, I especially interests you. Is there anything you can? Do you have any thoughts about decoherence in black holes? Or no? Well, um, <laughs> there's lots of things I haven't understood in the discussion this week, and. Um, as so I said, in this example I gave yesterday, it's easy to have a system that looks thermal but is actually uh, a pure state, mm -hmm. like in my pion gas. Uh, and um, in the case of black holes, one of the things I'm confused about more in connection with this uh, issue here is that, um, is the black hole really stationary? Or do I have to consider the whole process, including when the black hole is gone and it, I just had the radiation at infinity. Um, it seems to me if you do that, you'll end up again with a pure state. But uh, that's just my gut feeling without any real uh, calculation. So that, because what you're doing is you're throwing in something in a short time and then it's coming out, spread out over an enormous time. So uh, <coughs> that must imply some kind of very tricky phase coherence uh, if, if you view it as the global process. But uh, most, most of the things I've talked about are stationary or quasi-stationary problems. Okay. Maybe any other thoughts? Okay. If not, let's thank Leo again.